sorry. If you wish to sign up for any future discovery sessions, please visit our website, SheridanCLT.org. Please be advised that we are recording this Zoom session for future use on our website. Uh, no names or faces will appear on this recording, but just be aware that it is being recorded. Um, and now over to our historical educator and event coordinator, Carrie Edinger. Hello, and thank you for attending our new history project, The Human Migration of Southeastern Sheridan County. We're excited that you are here. And to give you a little background about Sheridan Community Land Trust, SCLT's history program, we hold two historical preservation easements, one on the Houston Homestead and also one on the Sheridan Inn. We are also known for the Black Diamond Byway, which is a tour of the mining communities that are north of Sheridan. And we're also developing new walking tours and some other virtual tours. So if you're interested in your community group having a tour with us, my contact information is in the chat box. Um, the Houston Homestead is kind of the starting point for the human migration of Southeastern Sheridan County. And we will be looking at the broad history of Southeastern Sheridan County under the themes of nomadic living, the horse, water as a natural resource and settlement. And as I created this project, I kind of realized that there is a lot of space for community members' memories or stories of these sites. So at the end, if you can um, include some of those in the chat box, Alexis, Alexis and I will be reading through them at the end and sharing them. Um, we're also open to questions or other historical information or open dialogue at the end as well. Um, I wanna thank all the community members and community organizations who have contributed materials to this project and the Wyoming Humanities Council who, is gen who has generously funded this project with a SPARC grant. Um, this virtual tour is accompanied by pre-recorded audio narration, and it will also be on the Sheridan Community Land Trust website after this presentation this evening. So let's explore some history. Welcome to the Human Migration of Southeastern Sheridan County virtual tour. From hunting grounds to 20th century events, the Human Migration of Southeastern Sheridan County project will look at how the human migration process has changed the landscape. This virtual journey will explore Southeastern Sheridan County through nomadic living, the horse, water as a natural resource, and settlement of the area. Try to imagine the land that makes up southeastern Sheridan County without the current town, county, state borders, or even the fences that we're accustomed to. Humans have been traveling through southeastern Sheridan County for about 10,000 years. A 1958 archaeological excavation of a cave site in the Clear Creek Valley gives us some evidence of that time frame. During the excavation of the Benson Kaufman Cave site, the excavation from the Wyoming Archaeological Society revealed several hearths within the cave, projectile points and scrapers, along with bone artifacts and antlers. The cave is within a sandstone outcrop and near a small spring in the high plain region east of the Bighorn Mountains. This area probably had a wealth of natural resources such as edible plants and roots, as well as elk, plains bison, and analyte that were all plentiful in former times. Sheridan County is part of a larger region known as the Powder River Basin Province, which includes the northeast corner of Wyoming and extends in southeastern Montana to the western side of South Dakota that includes the Black Hills. The Powder River Basin has been occupied by several Plains Indian tribes. With its low annual rainfall, the Powder River Basin is a large arid basin. It is believed to be more of an area 
that was passed through to follow and hunt the millions of plains bison. The tribes relied on the geography of the landscape to hunt the plains bisons. Buffalo jump sites are scattered across northeastern corner of Wyoming, and there is one near Piney Creek area. After the plains bison were led off the jump off point of the site, a water source such as Piney Creek would have been where the meat was processed after the hunt. During the 1850s and the 1860s, the Powder River Basin region was the last remnant of open land where native Indian tribes roamed on the Great Plains. Several native Indian tribes moved toward the Powder River Basin between 1450 and 1870. Some tribes followed the seasonal migration of the Plains Bisons and others were pushed west from the western expansion. Some of the native tribes who hunted in this region were the Arapaho, the Crow, Kiowa, the Seven Bands of the Lakota, Northern Cheyenne, Shoshone, and the Ute. Fur trade was part of the early western expansion, and fur trappers and traders would have passed through the Powder River Basin for acquisition and sale of animal furs. The French fur trade is believed to have traveled into the Bighorn Mountains in the 1740s. In 1806, after the Lewis and Clark expedition returned from their journey to the Pacific, they reported an immense number of beaver that inhabited the western mountain ranges. This furthered the interest of fur trade to the west and their interaction with Plains Indian tribes. In the early 19th century, the fur industry ruled the northwest of America in present-day Oregon. John Jacob Astor, owner of the Pacific Fur Company, was determined to expand his fur empire and trade western furs with Asia. Astor sent companies of men to scout a route between Astoria, Oregon, and St. Louis, Missouri. These expedition parties were known as Astorians. In 1811, Wilson Price Hunt led an expedition to find an overland route and established a fur trading post at the mouth of the Columbia River. The Astorians left from St. Louis and Hunt's plan was to follow the Lewis and Clark expedition northern route, but Hunt decided to head south and avoid the Blackfeet tribe. The southern route traveled across the Powder River Basin in northern Wyoming. The party entered Wyoming in August. It is notated in Hunt's diary on August 18th, a description of the Powder River Basin. Quote, we found it necessary to leave the mountains and turn back toward the broken countryside. When we had pitched camp, Mr. McKenzie and I scaled the nearby slopes. Our view extended in all directions. In the west, we saw far off some mountains that appeared white in several spots, and we assumed that this was the snow-covered Bighorn Range. Below the peaks, herds of buffalo ran over the plains." End quote. In February 1812, the historians finally reached the Pacific coast after losing a man and many supplies trying to navigate the Snake River in Idaho. On their return, they discovered the South Pass between what is now Farson and Lander, Wyoming, a route that proved essential to immigrants traveling the Oregon and Mormon trails. In 1834, a fur trading post was established on the Wyoming's Powder River, just outside current day KC and it was called the Portuguese Houses. What ended the boom of the fur trade and saved the American beaver from extinction was that beaver fur fell out of fashion in Europe in the mid-1800s, with the European-American fur traders relying on the regional plains Indian tribes to supply the fur pelts. The tribes gained political control on the production and trade value of the fur pelts, for Euro-American goods. The other side of this fur trade industry was when it declined so quickly it left native tribes relying on these goods, such as ammunition for guns.
and being exposed to new diseases such as smallpox that weaken the population of these Plains Indian tribes. Beginning ranching has similar characteristics of the nomadic way of following the wild herd. Southeastern Sheridan County previously was Plains Bison grazing lands that became occupied by cattle and sheep. Unlike the seasonal patterns of following the buffalo herds, these domesticated livestock moved within large property boundaries that were marked by natural boundaries, then later to fences. One of the first cattle drives through northeastern Wyoming was by Nelson Story, as seen here in this photo. Nelson Story made a fortune of $10,000 from a claim in the Older Gulch Strike, which was outside of Virginia City in Montana Territory. In 1866, he headed to Fort Worth, Texas for cattle. At this time, Texas was overrun with cattle since the cowboys were off fighting the Civil War. The Bighorn Mountain region was Crow Tribe Territory, designated from the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty. The northbound cattle drive would cross these native Indian territories, and Story was warned by U.S. troops not to travel this route for safety concerns. Story returned to Montana's Gallatin Valley with a thousand head of cattle, as well as getting a good look at Wyoming as an open range for grazing and for future cattle production. Today, at any given time, there are around 65,000 cattle being raised across Sheridan County. These routes to move cattle and take advantage of the open range grazing and lucrative government contracts were traveled as far north as Canada. These routes that the leggy Texas Longhorns traveled were known as the Texas Trail. A Texas Trail entered Wyoming near Cheyenne and headed north to Fort Laramie, Newcastle, Upton, and Moorcroft, and then went west to the Powder River, and the route then splintered into present-day Sheridan County. During the travel process across the Great Plains, the herds were moved slowly to avoid a stampede. Cowboys would herd the cattle 10 to 15 miles a day, which would be about 300 to 500 miles a month. Cowboys were usually paid at the end of the ride, and some of them rode to their home in a wagon and a horse, and others stayed and started ranches of their own. In March of 1879, a cowboy known as John B. Kendrick made his first cattle drive to eastern Wyoming from Round Rock, Texas. The Wyoming destination was in Lusk at ULA Ranch. Kendrick worked his way up to foreman of Converse Cattle Company to purchasing the cattle company in 1897. The OW, Old Woman Ranch, was on Hanging Woman Creek on the Montana and Wyoming border. He also purchased the LX Bar Ranch on the Powder River in 1902. The total Wyoming lands purchased by Kendrick was 62,089 acres, and these holdings became the Kendrick Cattle Company in 1931. The cattle drive would start from the state line of Montana and head south to a destination west of Arveda named Kendrick Siding. The Kendrick Siding had loading pens for cattle to be transported by the railroad. Kendrick asked the railroad to build another loading point on the west side of the Powder River because crossing the Powder River was risky on a cattle drive. By the mid to late 1950s, stock drives ended at Kendrick Siding because it became more efficient to truck livestock, while the railroad became less important as a shipper. Cowboys managed the stock drives with another significant animal of the West, the horse. The introduction of the horse changed many perspectives of the North American landscape. For the everyday living of the regional Plains Indian tribes, the horse was beneficial for traveling long distances,
while being integrated into their native culture. The horse is also part of the current American Western culture that is very much part of southeastern Sheridan County. Eohippus, or the Dawn Horse, is the name of the prehistoric horse. The first horse was probably not much bigger than a cat and had a back hunch similar to a rabbit with dainty legs, as seen in this illustration. The last North American native horse was estimated to have died out between 11 to 13 million years ago. Remnants of the prehistoric horse have been excavated in archaeological digs in the Bighorn Basin located on the western side of the Bighorn Mountains. By the mid-16th century, the Spanish colonies brought the horse we know today to current-day New Mexico area of the United States. The horse was introduced first by the Spanish conquistadors. The Pueblo Indians lived in the same region of the land. The Spanish colony brought livestock and new tools to the Pueblo, but the colony wanted the Pueblo to abandon their traditional ceremonies and culture and convert to the Spanish's Catholic religion. Pueblo people who served the Spanish ranchers learned to ride the horse and then use the horse to gain their freedom back from the Spanish governance. The historic event in the summer of 1680 when the Pueblos revolted against the Spanish colony is named by regional Western history scholars as the Great Horse Dispersal. It is estimated that 3,000 horses scattered around Santa Fe and began to migrate to the Great Plains regions. By the early 1700s, the Shoshone, Crow, and Kiowa acquired the horse and transformed their nomadic lifestyle in the Bighorn Mountains region. Before their arrival of the horse, the distance that could be traveled in a day was very limited. When the Plains tribes moved their camp for hunting purposes, teepees and domestic wares were usually carried by women or dogs pulling a travoise. On horseback, the native Indians could travel great distances and command a large territory for hunting and trade. In a land with no fences, it was inevitable that there were wild horses. The Indian pony was a free-born horse that came from Spanish stock and was known as the Mustang. The photo seen here is a native Indian saddle from the Jim Gatchell Memorial Museum collection. The saddle was given to Jim Gatchell by Shavehead from the Custard Battle. Horse heritage is specific to each tribe, and here are a few from the tribes who inhabited the southeastern Sheridan County. Around 1725 or 1730, a Crow Indian War Party either traded or stole a stallion horse from another tribe. They brought the horse back to Crow Camp in the Upper Wind River, which is now current-day Wyoming. This is believed the first time the tribe saw a horse. The horse stood as high as an elk, but it had no antlers. As the men of the tribe were looking over the animal, one man stood too close to the hind legs of the horse, and with this it quickly kicked him in the stomach area. The man dropped to the ground and rolled in the dirt. After the incident, a few of the friends of the man who was kicked nicknamed him Kicked in the Belly. Over time, this band of Crow tribe was known as Kicked in the Bellies. Today, the descendants of these people live near Lodge Grass, Montana, and are still called by this name. Other aspects from horse culture tell the introduction of the horse and reflect on the relationships between the tribal members and their horse. Sweet Medicine, a northern Cheyenne holy man, predicted the coming of the horse that would carry members of the tribe on the horse's back to reach distant places and be helpful in many ways. Sweet Medicine's description of the horse was an animal with a shaggy neck, hooves that are round, and a tail that almost touches the ground. A Lakota story tells of the union achieved between human rider and their horse. 
Scouts, Walking Crow, and his nephew, Laughing Beaver, were chasing a reluctant son all the way from the west to the east. In the three years that they spent with their horses, in the darkness they fused with their horses. When the scouts reappeared to the tribe, each sat upon their pony's back with no legs of his own. As explained by Big Tree, a Lakota medicine man, that the men and their ponies had become one. Horse culture continues today through Native Indian family names and activities such as the modern rodeo and Indian fairs. The European American Western horse culture was adapted from the Spanish conquistadors and Native Indian tribes horse culture. Today's horse tack has been adapted and well-crafted for specific work and transportation needs. With the distance in between towns and ranches in southeastern Sheridan County, one method of getting to school would be riding a horse. One of the early schools in this area was the Rock School in the town of Claremont. This one broomstone building was also utilized as a church and community building. The interpretive sign seen here is to remember the Rock School since it was torn down in the fall of 2016 due to deterioration of the building. Stagecoaches are part of the early mass transportation system that required a team of horses. One stagecoach route was from the town of Buffalo to Claremont. As you can see by this early photograph, seating was limited and it could have been a bumpy ride. The horse bit is an important piece of horse tack and it is a component of the bridle and the reins. All three of these pieces work together to give control to the rider and signal direction to the horse's head. This was used for a single horse or a team of horses pulling a stagecoach. 20 miles was about the average distance in those days for travel. The second photo is a horse bit artifact that is believed to be made out of forged metal from a blacksmith. Today, horse bits can be customized, such as designs from Tom Balding's Bits and Spurs in Sheridan. A few of the prominent ranches in the southeastern Sheridan County area were owned by John B. Kendrick, Willis Spear, and the Pratt and Ferris Cattle Company. With ranching becoming established across southeastern Sheridan County, as well as employment of the cowboys, this kind of made Sheridan a prosperous town for saddle makers. A few of the known saddle makers were Otto Ernst Saddlery and Rudy Mudra. This photo seen here is estimated from the 1920s and is Ernst Saddle Shop. In addition, Don King, who with his craftsmanship took the Sheridan-style five-petaled wild roses to become internationally known. Today, for both Native Indian tribes and Western American culture, the horse and horse tack are placed in the spotlight with the modern rodeo and Indian fairs. The beginnings of these activities are derived from cowboy sports that were meant to pass the time on cattle drives, such as team roping and bareback riding. On July 4, 1882, in North Platte, Nebraska, William F. Cody brought cowboy games to the stage with his Wild West show. This show traveled by train across the United States and by boat across the Atlantic Ocean to be performed before kings and queens. The Wild West Show presented cowboy and native Indian horsemanship and historical reenactments of the Pony Express Ride, Buffalo Hunts, and the Indian War Battles. Cody employed northern and southern Plains Indian horsemen, such as the Lakota. These performances that were attended by city folks got a glimpse of Western life, but also the early development of integrating rodeo activities with performance celebrating life in the West. Regional Native Indian fairs did not begin with modern rodeo events or inclusion of Native Indian culture. 
but a way to promote the cultural assimilation process of Native Indians on reservations and focused on agriculture, livestock raising, and homemaking endeavors. The first Indian fair, Crow Fair, was held in 1904. In 1934, the Indian New Deal policy aided the placement of Native cultural heritage into everyday life, as well as the yearly fair's activities, while putting aside the constant push for agriculture contest. From the Jim Gatchell Memorial Museum collection, this is a crow woman's saddle with beaded stirrups. This type of saddle would be used for formal occasions, such as the parade at Crow Fair. The Indian Fair's concept spread to other reservations. Other Lakota fairs and rodeos were held at Pine Ridge and the Rosebud Reservation. Sheridan County community still enjoys the modern cowboy sports and native Indian culture that is continued at the Sheridan Wyo Rodeo that was started in 1931. Two of the main resources for water in the semi-arid southeastern Sheridan County are Clear Creek and the Powder River. With the U.S. Western expansion, water has been managed in this area as a natural border for Plains Indian Treaties, water rights for a territory, and also being redirected for irrigation for ranching and agriculture. This 1883 map of the Wyoming Territory shows that Sheridan County was not even established yet, and the region was part of Johnson County. By the mid-1800s, the Plains Indian tribes felt the impact of the Western expansion with the consumption of natural resources. The U.S. Commissioner of Indian Affairs arranged a huge gathering in September of 1851 to discuss treaties and the newly assigned territories for each Indian tribe. The tribes who attended the gathering at Fort Laramie, Wyoming, were the Cinnaboines, the Seven Bands of the Lakota, Crow, Cheyennes, Blackfeet, the Mandans, and the Hadatsa. Each tribe had to hunt and keep their village within these new territories. During the establishment of the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty, the Powder River became a natural boundary for the land treaty with the Crow tribe on the western side and the Lakota on the eastern side of the river. The Powder River is known as Froze to Death Creek, or where men were covered with snow to the Crow tribe, where a war party got caught in a snowstorm, and some of the members froze to death. The Lakota place name for the Powder River means Shifting Sand River. When Wyoming was a territory in the mid-1800s, the water was claimed on a first-come, first-served basis. The idea of water rights was borrowed from gold mines in California and Colorado, which was known as squatter's rights. The basic idea behind the water claim was the person who claimed the water source had the better right than anyone who came along later. Territorial legislation agreed it would be good to record these claims on paper. Water claims that were recorded were not uncommon to have someone claim more water than what actually flowed in the stream. As more people came with the western expansion and the Wyoming territory grew, people also started to argue over conflicting claims, and these arguments moved to territorial courts. The judges didn't have the specific knowledge pertaining to water rights and usually leaned towards the amount on the recorded paper claim or even the size of the ditch. In 1888, Elwood Mead was hired as a territorial engineer. His main job was to figure out what claims were actually surveyed on the county courthouse books and the overall Wyoming water rights situation. These tasks would begin the drafting of new water laws. One of the first changes Meads did for the water law was to have an active state ownership of water. He established that no one could acquire rights to use water without a permit from the state. 
Meade's second change was to set up an expert board known as the Board of Control to decide water disputes instead of a court of law. The Board of Control is comprised of the state engineer and the superintendents of each of the state's four main hydrological basins that are the watersheds of the North Platte, Green Snake and Bear, Wind Bighorn, and the Powder Rivers. These superintendents had knowledge of water and to whom irrigators could bring issues to. Meade's new water law was drafted and voted into the Wyoming State Constitution in 1890. Today, Meade's idea of tying water rights to actual use is still in effect as a water management system. For the early Wyoming water history of southeastern Sheridan County, the Clear Creek Valley region is known for one of the earliest ranches, the Pratt and Ferris Cattle Company. Pratt and Ferris Cattle Company extended their cattle operation in the late 1870s from Cheyenne. The majority of the land was acquired by desert land entries of 1862 and the Homestead Act. Similar to the 1862 Homestead Act, the Desert Land Act promoted the economic development of the arid and semi-arid public lands of the western states. In Clear Creek Valley is where Pratt and Ferris Cattle Company established Big Red in present-day Ucross and Big Corals that was east of present-day Claremont for cattle and hay production. Pratt and Ferris Cattle Company established some of the first irrigation ditches in this area. Partnerships changed for the Pratt and Ferris Cattle Company and Chicago-based Levi Zeiger Leiter bought into the company. During 1892 to 1898, Levi's son Joseph was his agent to manage the business. From 1897 to 1898, Joseph attempted to corner the U.S. wheat market. He was briefly the largest individual holder of wheat in the history of the grain trade. Joint action from Joseph Leiter's competitors broke his corner on the market. Levi Leiter passed away in June of 1904, and the property became the Leiter Estate, and it stretched along Clear Creek from the Johnson County line to below the community of Leiter that is located between Claremont and Arveda. Historical reminders of this time period are the grain elevators along this stretch of land on Route 1416. In 1910, Joseph Leiter, manager of the state, announced the news of Lake DeSmet project. This project offered vast irrigation and a switch from growing hay to an open range system that would grow sugar beets. By 1921, the Lake DeSmet project expanded the irrigation and farming in Clear Creek Valley, and this was over 6,000 acres from big red and big corals that were under the new irrigation system. During this time period, the lighter estate properties began to be divided up into individual tenant farms. This tenant project leased the land to individuals and also the Russian-German immigrants who had come to the American West. The Clear Creek Valley was one of many U.S. Western regions to grow sugar beets. As a result, many Volga German families settled along Clear Creek and began farming. This helped to establish sugar beets as one of Wyoming's top crops. The Volga Germans immigrated to America from 1871 to 1941. In the late 1800s, they began to leave their agricultural life near the Volga River in Russia. This was due to a change of power over Russia and being forced into military service. These German immigrants were invited to the Volga region in Russia to farm Russian land, which is seen here in this map around the Volga River. Catherine the Great allowed the German immigrants to maintain their language and culture with her agriculture invitation. The Volga Germans who immigrated to Clear Creek Valley brought with them their historic German farming methods, as well as their German identity that established a close-knit community in southeastern Sheridan County. For three generations, the Volga Germans 
farmed the Clear Creek Valley and held on to their German heritage while facing difficulties with the unpredictable weather conditions that affected their crops and the anti-American sentiment during World War I and World War II. The expansion of irrigation in this area of southeastern Sheridan County was one of the many aspects that aided in the development of settlement in this area. New Frontiers initiated the movement of settlers to the American West and the dislocation of the Plains Indian tribes. In 1803, President Thomas Jefferson began the westward expansion with the Louisiana Purchase. The Louisiana Purchase nearly doubled the size of the United States from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains. Related events such as the California Gold Rush, the development of the Oregon Trail, and two economic depressions in 1819 and 1839 would encourage Americans and immigrants to migrate west in search of new opportunities. Another conflict that arose from the 1851 Native Indian Land Treaty was that the U.S. government was allowed to establish posts and roads in the tribe's territory. Other conflicts were between the tribes with each other claiming the land for hunting grounds. The hunting grounds and animal migration patterns extended beyond these new treaty boundaries set by the U.S. government. With the continuous western expansion and that gold was found in Montana, the Bozeman Trail was scouted as a northern shortcut from the Oregon Trail. The Bozeman Trail, the yellow route seen on this map, departed from the Oregon Trail at present-day Glen Rock, Wyoming, and headed northward on the eastern side of the Bighorn Mountains. The Bozeman Trail route went through the occupied territory of the Lakota and Crow. The Northern Cheyenne and Arapaho Indian tribes inhabited the land that was south of the North Platte River. From 1863 to 1868, the Bozeman Trail area had many skirmishes and main battles that were fought between Plains Indian tribes and the U.S. soldiers that were sent to protect the gold prospectors and Western travelers. In 1868, a U.S. Treaty Commission again arranged a meeting at Fort Laramie, but this was for a new federal policy that focused on placing all native Indian tribes on permanent reservations. The Treaty of Fort Laramie established the Great Sioux Reservation for the seven bands of Lakota. This reservation occupied the western half of South Dakota and the sacred Black Hills region. The Powder River Basin that is east of the Bighorn Mountains became the unceded Indian territory specifically for buffalo hunting. The Crow tribe was relocated to the northern part of their 1851 treaty boundary in current southeastern Montana. When gold was found in the Black Hills of South Dakota in 1874, the 1868 treaty was then broken. Though the U.S. government offered to buy the Black Hills from the Lakota, the tribe refused the offer and the U.S. Army did not prevent gold miners from entering this region. During this time period, the Plains Bison were overhunted and were near extinction. The Plains Bison were the main food source of the tribes, and this affected their everyday living. From the dwindling numbers of the buffalo, the unseceded Indian Territory was the first land area to be removed from their original 1868 treaty. The Great Sioux Reservation was divided into five smaller parcels for the seven bands of Lakota that are the current reservations Standing Rock, Cheyenne River, Lower Brule, Rosebud, and Pine Ridge. The Homestead Act of 1862 was signed by President Abraham Lincoln on May 20th, 1862. It allowed any adult citizen 21 or older 160 acres to settle. However, this land claim was utilized beyond individual homesteading, as we will hear about the town of Houston. Houston was just two miles west of present-day Claremont. Edward W. Houston, known as Doc Houston, and his wife Clarissa, and 
Their children, along with Clarissa's parents, traveled in three covered wagons along the Oregon Trail to Wyoming. Before the town of Buffalo became their home, they lived on Crazy Woman Creek in a dugout near Trabling for five years. There is a memorial marker in the vicinity of where the Houston family lived on Crazy Woman Creek. Doc Houston was prosperous in Buffalo, a community located on the Clear Creek crossing of the Bozeman Trail. He practiced medicine and operated a local drugstore. Doc Houston had additional knowledge of how to fire bricks for construction. From this, he made a supplemental income selling bricks for homes and the new county courthouse. He also followed the stories of the railroad and the growth of the West. He saw these opportunities as a way to plot a town by means of homesteading near a location of where the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad would pass. Houston had two potential sites for homesteading. Doc Houston filed for the Crazy Woman Creek homestead site in 1886, and the second site, northeast of Buffalo, was filed in 1887 by his mother-in-law, Sarah Pentengill. What enabled Sarah to file and own land was the Bill for Women's Suffrage in Wyoming, which was signed into law on December 10, 1869. This bill gave Wyoming women the right to vote, hold office, and to own land. Wyoming territorial legislator saw this bill as positive publicity and to entice women to immigrate and balance the gender ratio while aiding in the population growth of Wyoming so it could qualify for statehood. In 1889, the U.S. government wanted Wyoming to rebuke the women's equality law during the statehood process. Wyoming refused to rebuke the law and would stay out of the Union than deny women their rights. In 1890, Wyoming became a U.S. state, and in 1920, the U.S. government passed the 19th Amendment that gives women the right to vote 50 years after Wyoming. In the Powder River Basin, there were many other women homesteader property holders in this region. The anticipation of the railroad would soon decide which location would be the site for the town of Houston. In 1882, Sarah Pentengill received her patent for 160 acres, and she was 73 years old. In April of 1891, the Houston family moved to Sarah's homestead on Clear Creek and Doc Houston sold his Crazy Woman Creek homestead. This same year, Sarah sold her 160 acres to Doc Houston. His first project was to build the two-story rock home, which still stands today. Doc's sons, Harry and Fred, quarried the rocks and mixed the mud to set them, such as a typical 1890s masonry construction. Because Doc knew the railroad would head through Sheridan, he began to plan a town along the way. Houston and the new homestead would also become the stop for the local area stagecoach route. Talk of the railroad quickly spread through the region. By the fall of 1892, Houston was a bustling town with about 200 residents and 30 businesses, such as J.T. Brown's General Store and the Merchant's Hotel. There was also a four-page newspaper called the Northern Wyoming Stinger, and they published at least three editions during the town's existence. Despite optimism, after seven short months, the railroad bypassed Houston and continued to the town of Claremont. The original town of Claremont was platted and surveyed on September 28, 1892. Since the town of Houston was not a desirable location for the railroad, a land agent from the Lincoln Land Company was hired to obtain 80 acres of homestead land and lay out the town of Claremont. The would-be town of Houston died quickly as residents migrated to Claremont. Doc Houston and Clarissa lived in the homestead till 1908, and then they moved to Claremont. Doc Houston built a new residence in town with a general store and drugstore. Both lived in the area till their death and are buried in Claremont's Sunnybrook Cemetery. Today, the Houston homestead is under a historic preservation easement, and the 528 acres it sits on is also conserved by the Sheridan Community Land Trust. 
Even though Houston had a short time period of being a town, many of the other towns of southeastern Sheridan County evolved with the change of times and means of transportation. Before the train ran through southeastern Sheridan County on a regular schedule, there were railroad sidings established before the towns we know today. Established in 1891, the town of Suggs was situated on the east bank of the Powder River. Suggs was named for a local rancher and was known as the end of the tracks town with bars, brothels, and gambling. The town consisted of maybe two roads, tent dwellings, a few businesses, and very few permanent residents of the area, but plenty of transients or drifters. During this time period, the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad ended here till a bridge was constructed to cross the Powder River. Also during this time was the Johnson County Cattle War. An 1884 law to stop cattle rustling permitted the Wyoming Stock Growers Association to claim all unbranded cattle with roundups in the territory. The law was opposed by small ranchers and homesteaders and there was continued violence between rustlers and settlers. U.S. troops from Fort McKinney near Buffalo were sent to ease the hostility and restore order during the Johnson County Cattle War. In June 1892, troops from the 9th U.S. Cavalry, one of four African-American units of the regular U.S. Army that were also known as Buffalo Soldiers, established Camp Bettons on the Powder River. The camp was about five miles from the town of Suggs. The townspeople had suspicion that the U.S. Cavalry troops were allies with the Stock Growers Association. When the troops from the 9th U.S. Cavalry visited the town to partake in the local businesses, they were verbally harassed with statements associated with the color of their skin. At the local saloon, one soldier received a threat with a gun, and the two soldiers escaped out the back door with the help of the bartender. The troops were shot at as they rode out of town to their camp, and one of the bullets passed through a soldier's hat. Back at camp, the 9th U.S. Cavalry wanted to avenge the slurs against one of their own troops. A group of about 20 soldiers went on foot to the town of Suggs and forced their way into the center of town on the night of June 17th. One of the troops fired his gun into the saloon and there was an exchange of fire between the townspeople and the troops. The troops withdrew from the area and lost one of their own fellows, Private Willis Johnson of I Troop, the troops were placed under guard and an investigation of the incident happened. Local papers that were following the incident had glaring headlines such as war at Suggs and pitch battle soldiers attack private citizens in the town of Suggs. There is not a confirmed outcome of the soldiers investigation, but different accounts state from a minor punishment to a newspaper reporting court-martial. Both white and black infantrymen were transferred to Idaho, and it is believed to avoid the incident as a major public issue. During the summer of 1892, a railroad bridge was built to cross the Powder River. Railroad officials planned a new town on the west side of the Powder River named Arveda, and Suggs was no more. As the Industrial Revolution moved west in southeastern Sheridan County with the railroad, water was an important component for the early locomotive piston steam engine. Water sources were part of the process in determining the location of the settlement of a town during the early 1890s in the southeastern Sheridan County area. The steam train needed to stop about every 20 to 30 miles and add water to the engine's boiler. These water stops were called whistle stops. The advent of the railroad in southeastern Sheridan County established schedule stops at Arveda, Cadiz, that became lighter, Claremont, Alm, Verona, and Wyarno, 
and then on to Sheridan. Some of these whistle stops, such as Claremont, Alm, and Wyarno, became loading facilities to export livestock, grain, and sugar beets. When diesel locomotives replaced steam engines, the water stops became obsolete, and the towns usually became ghost towns. The towns that established a loading facility continued to thrive while ranching and agriculture were sustainable in the area in southeastern Sheridan County. Besides Claremont being known as a transportation point for livestock, freight, and stagecoach lines, the town was also the terminus in 1914 for the Wyoming Railroad going to Buffalo. This made Claremont a major transfer point for passengers, mail, freight, and express to Buffalo. Claremont became an incorporated town at the end of 1919. The town was becoming more established as a result of three industries, the railroad, agriculture, and automobiles with tourists. The original Claremont Railroad Depot was moved to the U-Cross property as an artist space, as seen here in the before and after photos. Route 1416, that was a major highway for tourist travel on their way to Yellowstone Park, has a couple of different names, the Custard Battlefield Highway and the Black and Yellow Road that references the Black Hills to Yellowstone Park. Today, south of Sheridan at the crossroads near Highway 14 and 16 intersection and where Clear and Piney Creeks meet is the park at U-Cross, established by the U-Cross Foundation in 2011. This open space preserves the extraordinary corner of the American West and the remembrance of a town named U-Cross. The town of U-Cross went through a couple of name changes before officially being named on November 28, 1916. The first name of the town was Cedar Rapids. That name, however, comes from Isaac B. Smith and Colonel Dowles, both from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. In 1912, these two men were associated in Buffalo with the building and promoting of the railroad up Clear Creek. A new town was part of this new development along with small units of land that could be farmed or ranched by Midwesterners. The Iowa stockholders came out to the west to visit and look over the surveyor's plans, which included a town with a county road as a main street. The name Cedar Rapids was used for two years. What changed the name was that the post office department objected to two words in a town name. So Charger was the accepted name until 1916. The name U-Cross came from the cattle brand of the Pratt and Ferris Cattle Company. The brand had a U with a cross beneath it. The town of U-Cross had a general store on Main Street with its post office in a partitioned off front corner of the store. Then U-Cross grew over the years and had gas stations, a cafe, and even a second general store, along with private homes and school building. At the end of the 1960s, the town slowed down, and then the children were bused to Claremont or Sheridan schools. Tourist travel also slowed down on Route 1416, with Interstate 90 passing through the area between Sheridan and Buffalo. So the next time you're traveling through southeastern Sheridan County, take a good look at the landscape and imagine all the different forms of human migration through this area. Special thanks to Claremont Historical Group, Jim Gatchell Museum, Lois Hewson Hall, Gregory Nickerson, Donovan Sprague, Little Bighorn College Library, Tim McCleary, Sheridan County Former Public Library Wyoming Room, Sheridan Travel and Tourism, Trail End State Historic Site, U-Cross Foundation, Wyoming Humanities Council, Wyoming State Archives, and Bill Yellowtail. Thank you, Carrie. That was really great. Thank you. It's very exciting to be able to share it. <laughs> um, if anybody has any questions or any stories to tell, uh, you can place those in the chat bar 
and Carrie and I will read them and Carrie can discuss any answers for you guys. Also, I'm going to place a survey in the chat bar. Um, it will take, I think, three minutes. If so, if everybody could fill that out, that would help carry out a ton. So thank you. Jim Scott enjoyed the program. Thank you for attending, Jim. I'm sorry if I say your name wrong, Jenny Aleo. Thank you, lots of great information. I really like the part about the horses. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I find the horses really interesting. I have a question. Um, what was your favorite thing to research well, or your favorite story you found? Well, they're all very captivating. And um, to be quite honest, it's kind of just starting to scrape the surface. Um, because a lot of this was also done during COVID times when we were all quiet and staying home. So I'm very excited to kind of get out into the community and to um, bring in more information or even other projects that kind of spur from this project. There's so much information in that area to keep researching. Dave Benson wants to know, can you tell us more about the railroad to Buffalo and why it failed? I think it had to do with more of the change of transportation, just the change of times. Um, I know that there is more information um, about that subject and the Claremont Historical Group has actually produced a book specifically about that railroad as well. Um, but overall, I think it was the change of times with transportation. Well, if anybody thinks of anything as, as we um, continue with our evening, please don't hesitate to reach out to the Sheridan Community Land Trust um, about any of the sites or the topics. And um, we look forward to seeing you at our next discovery session, which is about owls, isn't that correct, Alexis? Yes, the virtual hoop all about owls uh, and our presenter will be Tina Toth. So she's very excited. I'm excited. Yes. So I, I know the one that we did last year, the first virtual one was very well attended. Yes. Oh, I've always heard that Johnson County War was the reason Buffalo was skirted around. Oh, um, Yes, I've read that too. Uh, the question is from Lindy Burgess. I've always heard that the Johnson County War was the reason the town of Buffalo was skirted around for the railroad. And I have read that too. Um, I also read, and this is kind of old town gossip that um, Mr. Gillette, who was the railroad surveyor, was courting um, Mr. Coffin's daughter. And that could also be a reason why the railroad came to Sheridan, but that's old gossip that I saw. <laughs> Sometimes um, there's truth in that old gossip though. Um, but yes. That's a good one. Uh, Susanna Myers, an amazing amount of information. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for attending Susanna and Lindy. Yes. So we have a few more minutes if anybody else wants to add in maybe a family story or ask any other types of questions. Oh, good. Thank you, Lindy. Very informative. Yes. <laughs> We're glad you learned a lot. As historians, it's always 
what you we what, what we want to hear so all right well thank you carrie this was very informative i think we all had a great time and thank you for attending yes thank you everyone yes everybody have a good evening have a good night everybody bye bye